Continuous integration is the first stage of a continuous delivery deployment pipeline. That's one of the reasons why I really dislike the term CICD, but I'm a pedant, so what can you do? You can't have continuous delivery without continuous integration. The commit stage embodies continuous integration and then takes it further. A good commit stage will give us fast feedback. I generally recommend that you aim for under five minutes from the commit stage and a high level of confidence that if those tests pass, everything else is going to be fine. I usually recommend that you shoot for about 80% level of confidence that if all of the commit stage tests passing, your release candidate is going to be successful in trans transiting the deployment pipeline. If the commit stage passes, it generates that release candidate, and the release candidate is the bundle of software that will ultimately de be deployed into production if it makes it that far. So continuous integration is extremely important as the entry point uh, to an effective deployment pipeline. This is about much more than only the technicalities or uh, build automation. Uh, so how do we get this stuff right? And how do we make CI work for us? Here are my 10 rules for continuous integration. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. And if you like the video, like the video. Um, today I'm going to explore um, my 10 rules for continuous integration. A good place to start is probably to start with what continuous integration really means. And where better to start for that than to go to the original source, the C2 wiki. Um, the, uh, in the late 1990s, Kent Beck and a bunch of other people got together and were working on a project for Chrysler called C3. This was a famous project, and it was the project that gave birth to the extreme programming approach. Continuous integration was one of the practices that uh, extreme programming recommended. Uh, it was a discipline within uh, extreme programming. I can recall reading the fantastic C2 wiki at the time, uh, and I pulled out a few excerpts to just try and capture what they thought continuous integration was about. Development teams use code ownership to minimize conflicts among the people editing the code. The longer engineers hold on to modules, the more important it is to minimize conflicts. What if engineers didn't hold on to modules for more than a moment? What if they made their correct change and presto, everyone's computer instantly had that version of the module? You wouldn't ever have integration hell because the systems would always be integrated. You wouldn't need code ownership because there wouldn't be any conflicts to worry about. The fundamental assumption of continuous integration is that there is only one interesting version, the current one. I like those quotes. I think that they give us a clearer picture than perhaps some of the more procedural definitions of continuous integration that came along a little bit later. So CI isn't about the tools. It's about thinking about change differently. You're not doing continuous integration just because you're running Jenkins or Team City or Bamboo or any of those tools. It takes more than that. Continuous integration is about sharing information, making change more transparent. Continuous integration is a publication process. I want to see if my change works with everyone else's as soon as I can, continuously. To quote my friend Mike Roberts, continuous is more often than you think. So we want to evaluate our changes as frequently as we can to minimize the costs of both that evaluation and the quality of our work as a result. Before continuous integration, projects commonly suffered hugely from integration hell, the anti-pattern of, of finding out that it, how hard it was, how difficult it was to bring all of the pieces together into a working functional system. Some projects still do suffer from that problem. Continuous integration is the best way that we know of to address that serious issue. 
Commit at least once per day is one of the mantras that underpins continuous integration that's often missed. We want to be evaluating our, our changes as frequently as we can, ideally much more frequently than only once per day, but once per day is kind of the minimum standard to really qualify as a continuous integration process. Placing continuous into integration into its continuous delivery context, uh, I tend to use this picture. Uh, a deployment pipeline is intended to go from commit to releasable outcome. And we're trying to get that feedback multiple times per day. Another one of my recommendations in this space is to try and achieve that whole transit in under an hour. Now, if we're working that quickly, well, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to take all of these things seriously. So the continuous integration part of this process is the real fast feedback loop. As I've already mentioned, we're aiming to get a result in under five minutes. And the entry point to the deployment pipeline is that fast feedback, high quality, uh, continuous integration process. So if we're working at that kind of rate, how do we make it work? Here's my advice on the human aspects of continuous integration how to be good continuous integration citizens. Number one, always run the commit tests locally before committing them. The normal working practice in continuous integration is you probably ought to be practicing test-driven development. At least if you were to follow my advice, that's what you'd be doing. And in that kind of model, the way that I prefer to work is that I'm going to do the red-green refactor pattern. I'm going to write a test and run it and see it fail. That's red. I'm going to write the simplest change that I can think of to make the test pass to get back to a stable position. That's green. And then I'm going to refactor the test and the code to make them beautiful and elegant and a bit more generic while I'm in the stable passing stage. That's the refactor stage. At that point, I'm going to commit. So if I'm working well, I'm probably committing once every 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to be evaluating my change frequently. And at that point, I'm going to be running my test all the time when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm developing the code. So the tests that I'm working on, certainly I'm going to be running to evaluate the change. It's useful occasionally to, to also run a broader set of tests locally. The deployment pipeline in general and the continuous integration stage, the commit stage specifically, are useful resources, valuable resources to the team. So you don't want to hang those up for too long. You're just checking your failures if you can find those failures more quickly and more efficiently by running the tests locally. So run the tests before you commit, and then you've got a higher level of confidence that when you do commit, everything's going to be fine. Next, wait for the results of the commit build. Your job now you've committed is to wait and watch and not do anything else. Don't go home, don't go to lunch, don't go to a meeting, don't go and get a cup of coffee, don't go to the, the restroom, any of those things. You sit, you watch, you wait for the result of the commit stage. If you're doing this properly, it's going to be under five minutes anyway. That's one of the reasons why I recommend five minutes so you can optimize for this. And the reason why you're waiting is that you need to be the first person that notices if there's a failure. So you're there kind of poised over the keyboard, ready to fix any problems that you've inadvertently introduced into the, into the system. The next advice is in the event of if there is a failure, if there is a failure, kind of at least mentally set a clock. So start, start a stopwatch. You want to be able to fix or revert the change that introduced the failure within 10 minutes. This is a really good discipline to keep everything moving slowly. You don't want people committing a failure and then, and then going off and spending hours trying to figure out what went wrong. If you've made a mistake, you've blocked the ability of the rest of the team to make useful progress. So you want to get out of their way. So either if you're doing following my advice, each of your commits is going to be small and simple and probably easy to figure out when you've made it, what the mistake is when you've made one. So you can usually commit a fix immediately. You say, oh, I know what I did wrong then. And then you, then you commit the fix. If not, revert the change, go and look at it offline and try and figure out what went wrong and, what, and why it failed. Uh, and then you've got as much time as you like in order to be able to kind of come to that, come to that uh, decision making process. If a teammate has broken one of the earlier rules and has gone home, gone to lunch, gone to coffee, whatever, and left the build broken, 
revert their change on their behalf. Um, don't be precious about this. The deployment pipeline is a valuable resource. So you need to free it up. If they've gone home, if they've left the build broken, revert their change and then just gently, politely remind them that they should probably be a little bit more disciplined in future and that they shouldn't do that. Again, we're aiming to try and keep this route to production, that is the deployment pipeline, open for everybody on the team. If someone else notices that you broke the build before you notice that you broke the build, that's a build sin. You weren't paying sufficient attention, you weren't following my advice, and you weren't watching for the result. So you should be punished. Uh, and I like to gamify this kind of thing a little bit. We, what we're trying to do is that we're not really trying to punish people. What we're trying to do is that we're trying to encourage people to behave a little bit better. So on the various things that I've worked on uh, at different times, we once had to wear a silly hat. We had a stupid dunce's cap, then you had to wear it until the next person created, committed a build sin. Uh, on another team that I worked on, we had a jar with a slot in the top, and every time you committed a build sin, you had to put a pound in the jar, and then periodically we'd go to the pub and we'd spend the contents of the build sin jar. Um, but try and find a way of encouraging better behaviour. Um, we want people to be on the ball and committed, responsible for their work. And so if I commit a change, it's my responsibility to see that it succeeds. Once the commit stage passes, you should move on to the next bit of work, whatever that is. And maybe it's a meeting or maybe it's writing some more code, but you're free now to move on once the build stage has, has, has passed. Um, and this is part of the, uh, the optimization that is the deployment pipeline. The idea is to free up some time by doing subsequent evaluations in the pipeline in parallel with you doing new useful work. If a test fails, it's the committer's responsibility. If I commit a change into the, uh, into the system and that causes something somewhere else, maybe even your code to, to fail, one of your tests to fail, that's not your problem. It's my problem because I committed the change and I must take the responsibility for that change. And that's true however far that spreads. If you have a very big complicated system and a very big complicated deployment pipeline, the scope of your evaluation goes up. If you commit a change that for some reason results in a failure somewhere else that you didn't anticipate, it's still your problem. And that discipline is important to adopt to make people make sure that people take ownership of those things and you can keep, stay on top of failures. Next, if it's unclear who committed a failure, it's the responsibility of everybody who could have introduced that failure to get together to figure out who's responsible. We need somebody on the hook. And this is within this 10 minute window. So you're committing a change, you notice that there's a failure, and meantime, I've also committed a change. It could be either one of us that caused the problem. So, so you and I get together, look at the changes, um, and, and decide whose problem it is between us. And one of us takes responsibility to go and address that change or revert the, prop, revert the change. Again, we're aiming to keep our software in a releasable state, so being dis a little bit disciplined about this is important. The first eight of my rules are purely continuous integration related. I would recommend that you adopt these wherein, wherever and whenever you practice continuous integration, whether that's in the context of continuous delivery or not. The last two are a little bit more specific to working with a continuous delivery deployment pipeline. But they follow on from the continuous integration practices that I've already described. If you'd like to learn a bit more about how continuous delivery works and how these things are related, check out my training course, Better Software Faster. There are some links in the description below. Number nine, monitor the progress of your changes through the deployment pipeline. Once your commit has succeeded, your job is to move on to some new piece of work. But the evaluation of your previous commit is still underway. Your release candidate is going through a series of trials. It's going through acceptance testing, performance testing, manual testing, 
whatever it takes to achieve releasability. And it's your job to keep an eye out on that, on the success or failure of that progress uh, as you're working. Again, one of the mantras for continuous delivery is to work so our software is always in a releasable state. As soon as we have a single test failure, we reject the release, release candidate. Our software is no longer in a releasable state. So, test failures are one of the strongest signals that we get in our development process. So we should treat them seriously and we should react when we get that signal. When you notice that something uh, fails, set your 10 minute timer again. You've got 10 minutes from the time at which you notice the failure, wherever that failure may occur, to revert the change or to commit a, a, a something that fixes the change. So you want to be the person that notices the change first. You want to be the person who, who, who realizes that you are the person that created a, a failure. If you are not the person that notices that failure first, it's a build sin, put money in the jar, wear a silly hat, do whatever your penance is for committing build sins. The last in my list, if a later stage fails, address the failure immediately. This is kind of concomitant on the previous one, but we need to take this responsibility seriously. We need to keep the deployment pipeline free for changes. And so as soon as there's a failure, we should be treating that as a priority, addressing it immediately, dropping whatever else that we're working on, even to the extent of hauling colleagues out of a meeting or whatever else, we need to take these things seriously. Continuous integration is an important idea. It allows us to mitigate serious problems. Like everything else in engineering, it comes at a cost. The value outweighs the cost, for, for, for sure. But nevertheless, it requires us to approach development and release a little bit differently. But we'll talk about the costs and the different way of working another time. Why not hit subscribe so that you don't miss the costs of continuous integration whenever that's published. Thank you very much for watching.